to actually expose this device locally on the, the system, as well as remote over USB or Ethernet or a variety of different connectivity pieces. Um, so you can do processing remote, processing local. When you plug this into your PC over USB, it shows up as a native I.O. device, as serial, as Ethernet, as mass storage, and DFU. Um, so native I.O. over USB is to get the, the IQ data across, the radio data, to your, to your laptop or your desktop. Uh, serial is so that you can actually log into the device. We are running a, uh, uh, a Linux machine on here, so you can log in just like console, log in as root, and the password is analog. Ethernet is a great way to SSH and SCP over files back and forth to test things out. Um, uh, mass storage, you plug this in, it shows up as a hard drive on your laptop, and that's how actually we upgrade the firmware. You can take the firmware image and drop it onto the mass storage device. That's where all of our documentation exists. That's where all of our license files exist. Is on the mass storage device itself, so it's super easy to use. Um, and this is all built from the standard Linux uh, gadget USB drivers. Um, and then if you load a image up on here that doesn't boot for some reason, because we want to make it hackable and extensible, if the Linux image doesn't boot, it'll boot into a recovery mode called DFU, which is a separate USB device class, for, which basically turns this into a firmware programmer. And then you get to reprogram the serial uh, flash that's on here. And that's a standard feature in U-Boot, the, uh, the second stage boot loader that we use. So this does run embedded Linux. You can see up on the screen, oh, you can see up on the screen it actually booting Linux. Or not. Anyway, it, uh, it, it does run Linux. And uh, it takes about two seconds to boot. There's, um, uh, oops, sorry. It is uh, cross-platform. Uh, it runs the 414 LTS kernel, so it's actually a fairly recent kernel. Um, it's all build root and busy box. So this is about a two-second boot time. Uh, 32 meg of serial flash on here and 512 meg of PDR. Um, there is a small button on here that we typically use to. Um, push the button and power it on and it comes up in a programming mode if, if you want to recover something. People repurpose that button, they'll uh, power this from a um, uh, battery that is normally used to charge your phone, and then they'll walk around with a USB thumb drive hanging off the end and every time they want to record an RF signal, um, they can basically covertly push the button and it'll record a second of information stored on the thumb drive. And it's a great way to do uh, kind of covert wireless surveys so you don't have to um, drive around in your boat, you know, a mile offshore. <laughs> uh, so it is open source firmware. All the firmware is up on GitHub, and that would include like the HDL, the Linux kernel, all of user space, BusyBox, the, the Xilinx first state bootloader. Um, it's built up as a uh, multi-function or a, a multi-repository GitHub. So when you say git checkout, it'll clone all the different pieces for you. And you type make, it'll actually build everything for you in one step, assuming you have the Xilinx tools installed correctly. Uh, this does actually build with Webpack, which is not open, but is zero cost. Um, and it, it basically will uh, give you these files that you can just basically throw on the mass storage device and then uh, upgrade. It, it is cross-platform, so this is running on Windows, So it actually boots up and you can SSH into it with Putty. Um, so every time the device boots, it actually generates a different um, SSH key from, busy, or, uh, from uh, Drop Bear, uh, which then he provides a warning. And you can cat uh, proc CPU info and see what kind of machine you're on. Um, and uh, you know, it says a single core ARM. Uh, so there's basically a single, for those people who are aware, it's a single core zinc that's inside here, a 7810. And we can uh, actually use the putty to get a serial um, to the same device. And we can just go into COM uh, on this machine, COM5 or 45, and log in as root and analog and kind of go from there. 
Uh, it can be used, like I said before, uh, into a master, into a, a host. So that could be Linux, Windows, Mac, um, your embedded Linux target like uh, Raspberry Pi or BeagleBoard, uh, thumb drives because it supports on the go, uh, USB LAN, USB Wi-Fi. So those are plugged right into here, and we support all the common um, dongles that are actually supported with Raspberry Pi and the default image. Uh, one of the things we don't support by uh, building up is actually supporting uh, USB audio. So you can actually like decode FM or listen to FM radio, do these kind of things right on the device. Uh, we support the new radio. So this is actually uh, uh, an application called Phosphor, where it basically shows a waterfall, and what that waterfall is, is just a, a, the amplitude of that signal at that instant, uh, instant in time, and then that instant in time falls down the screen, and you can kind of recreate whatever you want, depending on what you're uh, broadcasting. Uh, when I was doing this, I was broadcasting with a SMA cable, not with antennas, because uh, this has a tendency to take down Wi-Fi. Uh, SDR Angel is another great open source application. Uh, you know, it's Windows, it's Linux, it's all based on uh, Qt and OpenGL, and it has a lot of uh, decoders built into it. It's great for starting out. For those people who are more interested in MATLAB, you can uh, do that. Um, there's books that are also available. Uh, with the books, the, 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 the one book that I was involved in writing is actually available for free, uh, featured on Hackaday. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is like, if you don't like math, this book may not be for you, because it is a digital communications book. Uh, the documentations are all online, but uh, like every open source hardware project, everybody needs more documentation, so if you're interested in helping, let it know. Uh, all the support model is online, everything is up on GitHub or the Analog Devices Wiki, and support is on our engineers' own forums. People have taken this design, so a company in Chicago named Epic, they've actually turned uh, it into a commercial product. And so this is actually very, very close schematically to the Pluto with the addition of some RF pieces that make it a little bit more uh, rugged and industrial. And then they can actually take this and use our HDL, use our software, and um, not have to create everything themselves. So people are absolutely leveraging open source, leveraging open hardware, these kinds of things in their commercial design. The piece that I'd like to talk about too is like test, uh, which is typically the missing part of open source hardware. So we actually developed a test jig for the Pluto device, which was a um, fairly large uh, quad site tester. So you put four PCBs in it, you close the top of it. Uh, when you close the top of it, these uh, bit of the PCBs would be held in place. These, the bit of nails would basically lift up, these pogo pins, and then underneath was uh, four Raspberry Pis, uh, all running an open, uh, or, uh, open OCD so we could program JTAG and test the device and test the USBs and all the, a variety of these kinds of pieces. It was all networked so they could communicate back to GitHub and post test results and send us emails and we could remote into it and you know, debug it when it was on the factory floor. Um, at, at least that was our uh, perception before we actually shipped it to China. Uh, so one of the issues that we had with this was actually um, the bushings that we put in that big uh, piece of plastic were put in with a uh, three-ton press, but uh, during the uh, repeated up-downs in the factory, the bushing actually came out and started binding, which basically made that uh, white thing at the bottom uh, not come up flat, and then the pogo pins on one side would never come up with the devices. And, uh, you know, so we learned a lot. We actually went to China, uh, saw how things were working. Uh, what we had was a unit that provided very nice, simple instructions. It was a red light, green light test. So red light boards are bad, green boards are good, and that was awesome. But it didn't provide any other feedback than that. So when somebody needed to take a bad board and find out what was wrong with it, there was no real way for them to do that. Um, and uh, you know, what we found out was that the, the, the systems that we built, whereas we could buy them in Europe, buy all the component pieces in Europe and buy all the component pieces in uh, the US, the component pieces were actually harder to find in China. Uh, so for the next test fixture we built, uh, we actually sourced it all from China. Um, and uh, we actually, you know, in terms of lessons learned when you go to China, when you have all these boards sitting around, there's lots of different things. Um, one of the things we didn't think about was actually using conformal coating or basically covering our test jigs with plastic because the factories are super hot and super humid and uh, we actually had issues with um, 
the PCBs because they weren't cleaned as thoroughly as they should, actually corroding and that's sticking on or sticking off, that kind of an idea. Um, you know, ensuring that uh, the test jigs are there and we have a backups. Um, so I think like test is actually a super important thing that many people doing open source hardware don't necessarily think about uh, because it's fun to make one. It's a different thing when you're trying to make a thousand a month or five thousand a month, and uh, it's uh, super important to be able to do that. And one of the things that we learned too is uh, reusing things between products is also super good. Um, and uh, when you do go to China, especially uh, Shenzhen and different pieces of Shenzhen, it's always good to have somebody who can speak uh, native uh, the language. Um, and then from a software standpoint, uh, one of the things we learned as well was when you're out on the factory floor, uh, the factory floor doesn't usually have Ethernet on it or available Wi-Fi or these kinds of things. Things you would take for granted here that's just not possible there. Um, so we built up a system that's basically a store and forward where all the test results are stored on an SD card and kind of go from there. Um, and this is kind of what the test chicks look now. So they're all built in China with local parts. Uh, Seed Studios actually facilitated this. They're actually local to Shenzhen. Um, one of the things that we saw in the test flow before was our test jig in the past would actually uh, print a sticker out that would go on the back of the box to tell you the serial number and the MAC address and these kinds of things. Um, but that's not the way they actually built them. They would uh, build and test 5,000, then they had a second station somewhere else. They would actually like assemble them in the plastic boxes and there was no way to keep the stickers and the, uh, the actual PCBs with the MAC addresses on them actually like uh, synchronized. So we have made a separate station to print out um, the, uh, the stickers. Just with, I think it's just a Raspberry Pi running uh, um, G label. And we've done this for other test chips. So some more sophisticated things like our um, analog kits, which are uh, you know oscilloscope function generator, which needs to be like tuned. Um, they're actually connected up to like netbooks. Um, then we have like fitting parts which are doing like JTAG and a SPY and GPIOs and those kinds of things to test everything. And when it comes to tuning capacitors with screwdrivers and those kinds of things, that's all actually done from a GUI on the laptop. It makes it uh, much easier. Um, so if you do have any questions about the kits or things, I'll definitely be around uh, the rest of the day and uh, feel free to get grab me. So thanks very much.